sir. <laughs> sir, Professor Chauhan is having a little problem with Zoom, uh, but he will join us soon. He wanted me to apologize to you. Uh, no, 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 sure. no, 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 no. Tell him that I'm fine. Okay, sir. No worries at all. Okay, uh, when he, whenever okay. he can join in, we can. He will join really soon. Sir. Sure, sure. No problem okay, at all. Sir. Okay. No, okay, may. Hello. So I hope yeah. you could hear Hello. me. I can. Okay. Uh, so, so, so the other judge is Dr. Arashi Bisanayaka. And uh, uh, I think the judges wanted a minute to talk before the beginning of the sessions, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anup, I am not sure whether okay. you can see me. Um, Hi, Arosha. Yes, I can. I'm sorry I'm late joining in. I've had trouble with you. No, no issue. Absolutely no issue at all. Anup, I just wanted to check with you. Um, uh, now, we have 
uh, uh, first thing is greetings from Sri Lanka. Would have been yeah. that much nicer to have had you here physically. But anyway, mm -hmm. we are joining in. Uh, now we have three minute presentations followed by uh, followed by a two minute question time. Now we can do this one of two ways. One is we could each take a minute and then ask maybe one question or so and then alternatively, uh, okay. or we could take candidates alternatively. I mark on the questions that you ask within the two minutes, which would you prefer, Anup? Um, I don't mind either, either way. Who are the other judges? Only the two of us are judges, so we can okay. decide. So we have two minute question time. Okay, shall we go for something like, uh, uh, you know, all candidates, if you can ask the first question, uh, and then after that answer, that, you know, within one minute or so, they will answer. No? So then I will ask the second question. And thereafter, if we still have time left, you know, maybe you can ask another question or so. Shall we adopt that uh, so that there will be, uh, you know, we won't have to waste time speaking to each other, uh, you know, like who would ask the next, next question or so. So all yeah. candidates, are you happy you asked the first question? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll follow up with the second question. Uh, yeah. And then we have to see 11. And the way it works, after three minutes, they have informed me one buzzer will go on, then the presenter has to stop. And then yeah. we have two minutes. At the end of our two minutes, the buzzer will go the second time, then we stop uh, asking questions. And okay. then, uh, then we get a little time after we mark, uh, yeah. if necessary, uh, we get a little time to, uh, time to mark. We could yes. actually discuss anything, I think, after this session is over so that we can see all 11 mark independently. And thereafter, if we feel like it, you know, we could just compare marks or whatever, discuss any contentional points, points of contention. What do you think about that? Would you like um, it any other way? Excuse me, sir, if yeah, I may yeah. disturb. Yeah. Uh, so today, so after this session, within a few, uh, actually within uh, at 5.45, there's a meeting for judges. So yes. evaluation has to be finished by then uh, if you want sir we can uh, give you time after each presentation or if you think uh, after the complete session is over discussing is fine that is also okay okay so i think what would be best is it is that it, it is after we've done the three minute presentation the three minute judges if you give us a minute because we have to populate the marks yeah uh, that's that's doable sir. yeah okay and then we can have a more detailed discussion at the end mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Arosha, quick question for you. I've got yes. two, two sessions. I've got session one and session two. Which one are we doing today? This is session I, two. Uh, this is session two, sir. Okay. Uh, session one was yesterday. That was a faulty email, sir. That oh, was, uh, okay. yeah. So this is the session. Uh, we were supposed to start five minutes. Uh, the session was supposed to start at uh, 2.45 Sri Lankan time. Yeah. The presenters are all here. We can go ahead if uh, both of you are okay, sir. Yeah. Um, okay, if you just give me a minute because I just need to get the session two up and, and make sure that we have marked everyone in the same way. Can you just give me a, a minute because I just yes, want sir. to make no sure problem. that I've got a pen and paper. So yes, I can sir. No problem. mark everyone. So just give me two minutes. Be back in a second. Okay. okay. Um, I have printed out 11 forms of the poster presentations. I will yes. mark on this and then once we finish, I'm going to photograph each and then WhatsApp to the number that you have mentioned. Yes, sir. That is Are you okay with that? Yes. Uh, sir. If you don't mind, I have it somewhere, but if you can just mention the number again, I can just write it here itself. Yeah, not, not seven, not. Not seven, not. Three, nine, seven. 397. Not 618. Not 618. I will repeat yes. that. Not 7 not 397. Not 618. That's right. No problem. Okay. I am ready. Okay. As soon as uh, Professor Chauhan comes, we can start. Sure. Right. Sorry about that, Arusha. Well, I'm fine. I'm fine. I uh, okay. do, What I've done is, I mean, I, of course, got some.
prints of the mark sheets. Anyway, you have the mark sheet, right? And yeah, there are uh, some areas that we have to give marks. So it doesn't matter. So one by one, we will award marks. And then subsequently, we can WhatsApp or email these sheets to, to uh, <coughs> the CCP. OK, I'm ready. OK, I'm ready to. Let's. OK, we can get the first present inside. Okay, I would like to welcome you to the second session of the poster presentations of the annual conference 2020 of Ceylon College of Physicians. Uh, first up is poster presentation number 12. Arterial insufficiency in erectile dysfunction associated with diabetes, a preliminary cross-sectional study. The authors are Diana Gamage JK, Atukorala TG, De Silva SMP, Sumanathilaka M, Soma Sundaram NP. The presenting author today will be De Silva AMNL. Now, let me brief on the screening study on erectile dysfunction associated with diabetes. Erectile dysfunction in diabetes is multifactorial, but there are no studies from this part of the world looking at the contribution of each of these factors. Therefore, we decided to assess the uh, contribution of arterial insufficiency in our patients. So, uh, we invited men age 18 to 70 invited men age 18 to 70 years with uh, diabetes for, to participate in a study on sexual dysfunction in diabetes. Erectile dysfunction was tested using IIEF5 questionnaire, which also graded the severity based on the score. In consenting participants with erectile dysfunction were included for the ultrasound study, which was performed by a single operator to avoid inter, uh, uh, observer variability. Ultrasound of the flaccid penis was uh, followed by man, uh, in injection of papaverin, which is a vaginal dilator into the scavenous sinuses. Manual self-stimulation was allowed. At five minutes interval, penile artery Doppler, as shown here, was performed to look for the peak systolic velocity, as shown here, and end diastolic velocity to get the best values. Based on the peak systolic velocity, arterial flow was defined as normal, borderline, or poor, Individuals with good arterial flow were further tested with end diastolic velocity to look for evidence of venogenic erectile dysfunction or venous leak. This gives the basic district, uh, characteristics of our 33 participants. From the table two, you can see the distribution of severity of erectile dysfunction based on the arterial flow. You can see that 67% of our participants had poor arterial flow. And on, only uh, 20, about 20 to 25% had normal arterial flow. Though priapism is considered a major complication of this procedure, none of our participants had this complication. From the table three, you can see that even these participants with poor flow had other potential contributing factors like cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy, which is a surrogate of pelvic autonomic neuropathy, med uh, medications causing erectile dysfunction, low testosterone, and peripheral neuropathy. On the other hand, erectile dysfunction uh, had been seen in a much higher percentage than peripheral vascular disease, ischemic heart disease, which are other territorial involvement of the same atherovascular disease. One major limitation of our study is small sample size, so we could not do statistical analysis. But still, we have shown that in men with diabetes and erectile dysfunction, uh, arterial insufficiency is a common one, and also penile artery doctor seems to be a minimal invasive test too assist that. And another important finding is it seems to be working together with other risk factors and probably a precedent of major vascular territory involvement and, uh, as in some other studies as well. Thank you very much for your high attention. We have two minutes for questions and answers now. Great. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Um, as you Thank say, you, a, a small sample size. Can you tell me, did you look for any other factors that would determine the prevalence and severity of erectile dysfunction? So you have a lot of markers here, which is around vascular sufficiency. 
did you look at uh, HbA1c or diabetes control or or anything else that yes sir. predict? Yeah, so uh, basically we have looked at HbA1c uh, and also peripheral neuropathy and cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy using a standard cardiovascular autonomic function test, all three ECG findings and testosterone levels as shown here, and also a list of medications that are potentially causing. The HbA1c, uh, the values and blood sugar values, diabetes duration values all have been shown here, but we have not gone into the associations because of the small sample size. Uh, we realize that uh, it won't show any significance anyway. Therefore, we didn't categorize them based on that, but in a larger prospect of our patient groups, which I'm going to uh, present later, looking into the all contribution factors, those are seen. But in this particular study, we have targeted mainly on vascular insufficiency. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Arosh Adhistanayaka. Um, can you tell me the clinical and the scientific implications of your findings? Yes, sir. One is uh, penile artery Doppler had been out of practice for some time, but now it's coming in some of the parts of the world. And it had been, uh, it's still not being used here, particularly because concerns of safety and use. So through this study, first we want to establish as a preliminary study that it can be done safely and show uh, importance arterial insufficiency as a clinically important finding for the management. So that's why we wanted to see whether our test, this can be performed in our setting and also whether it can determine the arterial flow. And also we wanted to see whether it's the only factor or whether there are contributing factors to see whether our people are just having one risk factor to get, to get the many factors. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so I will be staying till each of you give me the go ahead for, to start the next presentation, sir. Yeah. But I was showing the more earlier the character. Yeah. This was exactly what I opened uh, when you came. This is one okay. folder. This is the folder that they're using. Yeah. Okay. Rosh, I'm this ready whenever you are. Okay. I'm okay. 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 Should we do the next one? Yes, please. Are we okay? Okay, so shall I uh, call in the next presenter? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Post presentation 13. Comparison of eGFR between normal and abnormal parameters of metabolic syndrome among adults in Western Province, Sri Lanka. The authors are Sirivadana T. D. D. K. Soisa E. P. N. Fernando D. R. Pereira H. M. U. A. S. Abedira T. D. Tesva S. E. Katulanda P. The presenting author today is Samarathunga T. A.
Association of Metabolic Syndrome and its parameters with EGFR among adults in Western Province, Sri Lanka. Uh, metabolic syndrome is a cluster of abnormalities associated with risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular accidents. But the impact of individual parameters of metabolic syndrome on estimated glomerular filtration rate has been conflicting. Therefore, our objective was to compare the EGFR between normal and abnormal levels of metabolic syndrome parameters. For that, we used the data of 774 participants who were recruited to the Sri Lankan Non-Communicable Disease Survey from Western Province. And EGFR was calculated according to the MDRD equation and metabolic syndrome was defined according to the IDF criteria. We compared the mean EGFR between normal and abnormal levels of each metabolic syndrome components, HDL, triglyceride, fasting plasma, glucose, and obesity separately. Then we identified the participants with metabolic syndrome as IDF guideline and compared the EGFR between them with normal group. For those comparison, we use the independent, theta, independent sample t-test. Our results showed uh, majority of the participants were female in, and mean age of the participants were 49. And this figure showed that out of the five components of metabolic syndrome, we could find significant differences between mean abnormal and normal levels of fasting plasma glucose, blood pressure, and HDL component. We could not find the significant difference for triglyceride and obese. Our finding was supported by a Chinese article as well. And, uh, mean EGFR was not significantly difference between metabolic syndrome group and non-metabolic syndrome group. So we can conclude that even though we find the even though we can find out the difference between each component separately, uh, when we considered metabolic syndrome as a whole, we could not find a significant difference between normal and metabolic syndrome group. Thank you. Uh, if I may disturb, uh, were there any parts of the presentation that were not heard because the signal was breaking up. Uh, I'm okay. I heard what she said. Uh, this okay. is Arosha. Yeah, I'm fine. It's all good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. It's finished. No, you can better. Restart. No, no. No, no. You go on. This time for the presentation. Yeah, I think fine. Uh, now. Special answers then. Fine. Okay. Are you ready for some questions? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll do the first question. So thank you for the presentation. Um, it was a very large cross-sectional survey here. Just a quick methodological question. How did you measure the glucose? Was it an HbA1c or just a random glucose taken at any time in the day? Uh, no, it was fasting, fasting plasma glucose. We asked the participants to be on fasting for 10, 10 to 12 hours and we collected the blood on the following day and did the laboratory investigation okay thank you so if so the message is that the obesity and triglycerides didn't really affect EGFR, but the other three things which are you might say common sense hypertension uh, hyperglycemia and lower hdl levels were associated with a low egfr do you have do you do you think you can do anything else with the data to assess the magnitude of the risk. So out of those three things, the hypertension, glucose, and HDL, which one do you think is predominant in EGFR? Which one is gives you a stronger signal? Do you think uh, there's anything you can do with the data? Yes, blood pressure. Okay, how, how, did, how did you decide on that? So the difference, I mean, the normal and abnormal groups levels are the significance I mean, is, difference is, uh, too large when compared with other components. Yes, I, 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 I was just going to say you could do a straightforward analysis if you look at uh, two groups, low EGFR, high EGFR, 
and then just did some kind of multiple regression, it will, or a logistic regression, it'll give you a size of the odds ratios of having low or high EGFR among those parameters, and that will give you an assessment of which yeah. one is the predominant one. So thank yeah. you. No more questions. Uh, one question from me. This is Arusha. Now, uh, metabolic syndrome is something we spoke about 15 years ago. Any reason why you went back in time and looked at metabolic syndrome? Because we don't, we look at cardiovascular risk in a completely different way now. Why yeah. did you go back in time to do look at metabolic syndrome? What are the reason? Uh, when I mean, when we just observing the patient I mean, participants, we we could find the high prevalence of. Uh, I mean, metabolic syndrome among these participants, the, they are a normal, I mean, not uh, uh, not uh, any disease person. They are, we assume, we call, uh, for the clinics, we ask them to come. All of them were normal people. And even among them, we could find this much of prevalence. It gives us a message that we should. Uh, okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Are we done with the question, sir? Yes, yes, done. Okay. okay. okay thank you. Okay, you can go ahead with the discussion now, sir. Okay. I'm ready, Anup. I didn't see your name. Yeah. Okay, I'm ready for the next one, too. Okay, uh, Harini, both of us are ready for the next one. Okay. Okay. Harini, we are ready. Harini, can you hear us? Harini, we are ready. Okay, uh, Harini, we are ready, Harini. Okay, sir. I was starting the lecture with the presenters. Yes, okay. All right. Those, no problem. Now, uh, actually, we are not discussing after we finish. We are marking independently. So you can actually okay. be logged in. You don't have to log out or anything. Huh? We are not discussing ah. anything. So no, no worries at all. You just get logged in so that because we right. finish quickly, so we can get on with the next one. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. The presentation 14 prevalence of the metabolic syndrome in western province sri lanka the authors are soisa epn fernando dr abedira td sirivardana tddk samarathunga ta tesva se and katulanda p the presenting author today is uh, Mr. Thilina TAS. Good afternoon. I'm Thilina Prasamathanga from Diabetes Research Unit. Today I'll be talking about the study which we did on uh, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in the Western province. Metabolic syndrome is a group of conditions including uh, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and uh, hyperglycemia. And they occur together, resulting in the risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and non alcoholic fatty liver disease. And uh, over the years, metabolic syndrome is estimated to have a prevalence of 47.2% and with an annual incidence rate of 3.5% among adults in Sri Lanka. 
Therefore, our objective was to assess the prevalence of metabolic syndrome and its diagnostic components in the Western province, Sri Lanka. So our study methodology included participants who were uh, 843 participants who were recruited using cluster sampling method to the Sri Lanka non-communicable disease survey from the Western province and uh, adults in the age range of 20 year, 22 eight years were included and metabolic syndrome was diagnosed according to the International Diabetes Federation criteria. And according to our results, the mean age of the total population was 49 years with females representing a majority of 61.8%. And the mean age of the metabolic syndrome group was 52, uh, 52 years with an, uh, females representing a majority of 72 years, 72.1%. 72, 72 and, uh, and the prevalence of metabolic syndrome was found to be 42.8% in the Western province of Sri Lanka. And moving on to the metabolic components of the metabolic syndrome prevalence from the total population, we found out that central obesity out of the 843 participants, 62.8% had central obesity, followed by reduced HDL of 49.6% and hypertension of 49%, hyperglycemia of 43.9%, and raised triglycerides of 38.9%. And the uh, prevalence of metabolic syndrome components among the metabolic syndrome participants, we found out that uh, they had hypertension uh, with a prevalence rate of 79.5%, uh, followed by raised fasting plasma glucose of 76.9% and reduced HDL of 78.6%, and finally raised triglycerides of 58.2% prevalence. Therefore, these uh, prevalence rates are, rates are quite significant. They are by raising the alarm on the risks of other comorbidities, in the, including cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Therefore, our final concluding remarks would be that uh, during a clinical encounter, if patients are presenting with central obesity and any two of the diagnostic components of metabolic syndrome, uh, uh, they should also be screened for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes mellitus, including other uh, comorbidities. And moreover, Awareness on healthy lifestyle and that should be also encouraged on community level to prevent the risk of metabolic syndrome and its com com uh, complications. Thank you. Right. Are you... Yeah, one second for the presenter to add the headphones, sir. Okay, we can go ahead. Yeah. Great. Thank you for the presentation. It was a nice, large cross sectional study. Um, yeah. It's, it's a huge public health problem, as you can see, almost two thirds of your patients were obese and exactly. prevalence of METs was over 40%. How does your data compare to previous studies? Is this high, low or about the same? Uh, yeah, so uh, in 2012, uh, Prasad Katlander and his team estimated a prevalence of 23.4% uh, in 2012. But now over the years, over eight years, now we have found out there's a prevalence of 42.8%. So, and so we find that it's a uh, significantly high number when compared to the previous studies, uh, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome. Did you, obviously this is done with the University of Colombo. Where was your sample population? Was it city yeah. or rural? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's from the western province of Sri Lanka. So it uh, it includes three districts: Kalutara, Colombo, and Gampa districts. So we did cluster sampling, and through random selection, uh, we uh, took the Gram and Eldari divisions and uh, uh, included uh, participants around for uh, for the clinics to screen for the uh, communi non communicable diseases. Right. So are you assured that you had a heterogeneous sample population, including city dwellers and rural population? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, through statistical methods, uh, we did uh, the uh, uh, sampling uh, of the uh, districts and the populations. And in that, we have uh, from the Kalutara and Kalambo and Gampaha, we had rural as well as urbanized uh, samples. So yes, I believe it's an heterogeneous uh, sample. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, right, just one question. Do you think? Yes. Uh, oh, no, I think we've run out of time. That's fine. We'll just leave it oh. at that. Okay, that's okay. fine. Okay. Okay, so then thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you.
Arusha, I'm sorry about that. I asked to come. No, that, that's fine. You, you, you covered all the ground that I wanted. So just leave it at that. Okay. okay. You just, Thanks. I mean, you had covered all the ground. That's fine. Okay. I'm fine, Harini. We can go to the next one if when Professor Chauhan is ready. Okay, sir. Yeah, I'm ready, Harini. Okay, let's go to the uh, the next presentation. Presentation 15 Sexual Dysfunction in Men with Diabetes, a cross sectional study at Diabetic Clinic, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. The author, Atukura G, Kamaladan G, Dilagange JK, Harlanga G, Sumnathilaka M, Somasundaram NP. The presenting author is De Silva A M N L. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to present our study on sexual dysfunction in I men with diabetes. Uh, sexual dysfunction is one of the commonest complications of diabetes associated with poor quality of life. But there are no studies from Sri Lankan uh, setting much looking at the contribution as factors, associations, and implications. Therefore, we decided to assess the prevalence and associations of sexual dysfunction in our patients and also to identify the healthcare seeking practices of these men pertinent to their sexual dysfunction. Let me take you to the methodology. Uh, we invited uh, men aged 18 to 70 with diabetes to participate in our study on sexual dysfunction. These are the exclusion criteria. Consenting and eligible participants underwent, uh, were interviewed for the social demographic data and clinical information. Uh, for the sexual dysfunction, three main domains assessed were erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, and hypoactive sexual desire disorder, or Lower libido. For the first two, we used validated self administered questionnaires, IIEF5, uh, giving a score between 5 to 25, with higher scores giving higher degree of sexu uh, better sexual functions. We enrolled 155 patients. Uh, figure two shows the uh, distribution of different components of sexual dysfunction. As you can see, the erectile dysfunction was seen in 80% of our participants at different degrees. Premature ejaculation was tested only in 30, uh, 100 participants because the others could not achieve satisfactory ejaculation. 20% had low libido. Altogether, 83% had some form of sexual dysfunction. Interestingly, 72% have not revealed this to any of the healthcare worker. Only 12% have received any treatment. The rest of the analysis on, is on erectile dysfunction because that being the commonest sexual dysfunction disorder. Uh, the table one looks at the IIE score correlation with some of the, the continuous variables. You can see that age, increase in age and declining EGFR are associated with worsening IIEF5 scores or worsening erectile dysfunction. In the table two, you can see that participants with peripheral vascular disease, peripheral neuropathy, diabetic retinopathy, and chronic kidney disease had higher prevalence of mild to moderate or higher degrees of sexual dysfunction. Association is with alcohol use remains unexpected, but there are several possibilities. Uh, the main limitation of our study is uh, lack of data on some of other risk factors like low testosterone, uh, peripheral neuropathy, which we were planning to do at the second follow-up visit, but due to current situation, some data were missing. However, this clearly shows that sexual dysfunction is common among men with diabetes, often remains neglected. Recognition of these association would enable the clinician at least to target the high-risk individual so that targeted therapeutic evaluation and intervention can be performed. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Right. We can go ahead with the questions. Hello. Thank you very much. It's a nice presentation with a very simple message, Thank I think. You, Basically, the prevalence of erectile dysfunction is quite high when you look for it. But as you say, nearly three quarters of patients 
uh, didn't declare this to the healthcare practitioners, so they were yes. not available for treatment. Did you did you have any idea about how the erectile dysfunction was impairing their quality of life? Yes, sir. Now, as I mentioned, the uh, life assessment through SF36 question I was done in the second visit. Uh, the second visit data is missing due to a uh, lot of uh, interruptions during past several months in the country. But uh, from the uh, few patients we looked at, uh, quality of, poor quality of life was associated with sexual dysfunction. But we, out of 155, we had only about 60 participants fill the SF36. So we did not uh, put that data into this presentation. OK, thank you. Uh, hi, may I, may I know how you validated? Uh, what was the validation of IIEF? So, IIEF was validated internationally and used in Sri Lanka by three other investigator groups previously, including uh, Malavigi et al. and also Nirosha et al. in Tamil. So uh, therefore, uh, we, uh, they have uh, used the uh, translated pre-tested form, which we have used. Uh, we have taken from them, but uh, we, we have not separately validated the questionnaire. Yeah, just one little question. That is, uh, now CKD stage 5 you excluded, and the CKD yes, that you have in the results is... is about stages... 5, that is EGFR, above 15 still, high, uh, low EGFR is associated. None of the people with low uh, EGFR less than 15 were included. Still, CKD was associated, stage 3 and 4. That's fine. Uh, I have uh, no more questions. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, tell me when it's okay to bring the next presenter in. I'm fine when, uh, whenever okay. Roger's ready. I'm, I'm fine. fine, yeah, I'm fine. Okay, okay, let's get in PP16. Uh, post presentation 16 clinical, path uh, clinical pathological correlation between presentation and treatment outcomes in class 3 and Four, lupus nephritis treated with cyclophosphamide, a retrospective study. The authors are Lanarol RD and Atukorala I. The presenting author is Vijay Ratna DR. Good afternoon. The study that I'm presenting is a clinical pathological associations of presentation and treatment outcomes in class three and four lupus nephritis treated with cyclophosphamide. The clinical pathological presentations and prognosis of class 3 and 4 lupus nephritis vary according to ethnicity, and there is very little local data. Current induction treatment protocols are largely generic. The purpose of this study was to describe the relationship between clinical pathological characteristics at presentation and treatment outcomes in a local cohort. Our data was collected retrospectively, and the setting was the University Medical Unit of the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. They included patients aged 14 years and above with biopsy proven class three or four lupus nephritis who had received induction therapy with either NIH or urolupus protocol cyclophosphamide and had been followed up for 24 months or more. This is the data we collected, characteristics of clinical presentation, histopathological activity on kidney biopsy and treatment outcomes with regard to treatment failure and relapse. The histopathological activity on biopsy was categorized according to activity index as low if it was at median or below and high if it was above median. Associations between activity index, clinical presentation and outcomes were assessed using chi-square test. The p-value of less than 0 0.05 was considered statistically significant. 50 patients were recruited, 33 had received NIH-like protocol cyclophosphamide and 17 urolupus, and the median activity index was 9. An active urinary sediment or nephrotic syndrome at presentation was significantly associated with an activity index of more than nine. There was no association between activity index and the presence of either renal impairment or hypertension. With regard to outcomes, an active urinary sediment was significantly associated with persistent nephrotic syndrome at six months, as well as renal flares, and this was increased almost fivefold in our study. A high activity index was not associated with treatment failure, but was associated with renal flares and follow-up. And again, this was increased almost fivefold in our study. 
So in conclusion, an active urinary sediment and a high activity index at presentation appear to associate with poorer treatment outcomes, including renal flares, in patients treated with cyclophosphamide. Prospective studies are recommended to clarify risk factors further for poor outcomes and to guide a personalized treatment approach. Further suggested areas of study include assessing the place of a post-treatment renal biopsy in patients with high clinical or histological activity at presentation. The limitations of our study are that, are that it was retrospective in nature and included a small sample size. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, we may proceed with the questions. Great. Thank you very much. It's a, a nice retrospective study. I acknowledge your limitations, which you have said. So the clinical message is that the baseline more active disease and, and presence of urinary sediment is associated with poor outcomes at six and 12 months. Did you, have, did you have any data on death? How many of these patients were alive at two years? No, so this is a retrospective study. So it, we don't have any prospective data and the patients were recruited from our clinic. Right, so at the time that you look back, yes. could you say that two years after the biopsy was done, how many were still alive? So you, you sent no, the data at 24. Uh, no, so we, um, the data was collect collected over the last few years and we recruited patients from our clinic. So these were all living patients. We don't have a database as yet to look back on our uh, patients over several years. So we only were able to recruit the live patients. How do you uh, think that would affect your analysis? So it would definitely affect the analysis, and that is one of the limitations uh, of this being a retrospective study. Um, so there could be patients who uh, went on to develop treatment failure or, or, or died or had um, died either due to severe lupus or due to adverse effects of drugs and so on, and they wouldn't be included in the cohort that we sampled. So if we really want to get uh, better data, we need to do a prospective study, and we're in the process of establishing a database to do this. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, one question from me. Uh, how, now, because you said at the very outset that it differs on based on ethnicity, the outcomes. Yes. How do your findings uh, compare and contrast with those from other places in the world? Yeah, so we analyzed, uh, analyzed this data and, and compared it with other countries. One of the concerns is that the, that the uh, treatment that, the, that, we, that we use has mainly been uh, tested in people of European descent. And what we found was that despite having um, higher disease activity in our cohort, the treatment outcomes were similar. Again, our data is retrospective. Um, and the, the, uh, the studies that we base our treatment on are prospective studies. So we can't directly compare. But the data that we have suggests that the treatment is Okay, so right. We need to do more prospective studies. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Once again, so can you give me the go ahead? I will proceed to the next presentation. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm fine. Okay. Uh, post presentation 17. <laughs> Patient characteristics, risk factors, and ischemic stroke subtypes in patients who underwent thrombolytic therapy at professorial unit, teaching hospital, Anuradhapura. The authors are Senanai HMS, Lakunara order NC, Viravansa MRP, Pilapitya SD, Sandra C, Pushpakumar PHJJ, Siribaddana S. The presenting author today is Rakunara RMCE. Good afternoon. Uh, my topic is patient characteristic and risk factors and ischemic stroke subtype in patients who underwent thrombolytic therapy. Uh, so, uh, 
we all know the stroke is a well known leading cause of mortality and morbidity worldwide of all stroke 80% are ischemic and thrombo ischemic stroke and thrombosis with the intravenous uh, tpa is the standard treatment and this study aimed to describe the patient's characteristic risk factors and subtype of only ischemic stroke patients who underwent thrombolytic therapy and the study was carried out uh, in the medical ward at professor unit Beijing Hospital Andhradapura, uh, and the data were collected mostly prospectively from uh, time period of uh, March 2016 to 20, uh, June 2020, and all uh, all of 109 patients received thrombolytic therapy, and among them, uh, majority were males, uh, and as a percentage, it was 63.3, and the mean ages of uh, all was 61.7, and there was no mean age difference in between the sexes. Uh, in between both genders and p value was 0 0.86 and uh, there i uh, i have graphically represented the age categories there you see uh, there are 12 patients below the age of uh, 45 years mean, meaning that there were 12 young strokes uh, in the sample and most common age category was uh, 55 to 75 years and uh, distribution of patient by type of stroke here i use Oxfordshire classification that is mainly based on the clinical features mostly plus the brain imaging as well. Uh, in that, the partial anterior circulation stroke was the most commonest, 41.3 percent, and then the lacuna stroke, 37.6 percent. Uh, and next, uh, total anterior circulation stroke was 19.3 percent, and uh, posterior circulation stroke only two patients, uh, 1.8 percent. And most commonly observed uh, symptom was the unilateral weakness and left-sided symptoms were frequent compared to the right-sided uh, symptoms. Uh, uh, in the distribution of the risk factors, the most commonest risk factor identified was the hypertension. It is nearly almost 60 patients and next diabetic, uh, type 2 diabetes. And there were considerable number of patients with uh, previous diagnosis of stroke or transient ischemic attack as well. And there were 46.4 percent of uh, males of total males were current or ex smokers. So, in conclusion, the almost all patients had unilateral weakness, while left-sided symptoms were the frequent compared to the right. And hypertension was the commonest identifiable risk factor, and partial anterior circulation stroke type was the commonest observed subtype. Thank you. We may go ahead with the questions. Thank you very much. So over 100 patients, mainly left-sided strokes, um, weakness, anterior circulation. Do you have any data on how effective the thrombolytic therapy was in these patients? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I have data on uh, how effective the thrombolysis was, but in this presentation, it was not included. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, with my data available, 36.6% uh, uh, has had a significant improvement following the thrombolytic therapy. That was based on the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, which I have presented as an oral presentation yesterday, sir. I'm sorry I missed your presentation yesterday. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes. So what's the clinical implication of what you have found? Uh, you mean, sir, clinical implication means thrombolytic yes, therapy? the scientific or clinical importance of your work, if you can tell us. Yeah. Uh, uh, this study was carried out in, the, uh, in Andhra, the teaching hospital Andhradapura, and the thrombolytic therapy was started since from 2016 as an oral treatment there. So, uh, the, uh, so there was uh, no study relevant to the ischemic stroke subtypes and the distribution of the symptoms. So this might be helpful for the uh, future studies to continue the thrombolytic therapy as well as... Uh, what, right, sorry to interrupt you. What's the most important thing that you you learned from this study? At least you can tell that we can learn from this study. What's the most important thing? Yeah, uh, the uh, com commonest type of ischemic stroke here, you can see the partial anterior circulation stroke. And uh, 
uh, and the most uh, thank you very much no worries yeah. thank you so much okay thanks bye thank you sir okay thank you op 11 I am ready. Arosha is ready. I am ready now too. Okay, we can get the next presenter. Poster presentation eighteen. prevalence of pathogenic autoantibodies and clinical characteristics of patients suspected of autoimmune encephalitis in sri lanka the authors are professor tashi chang professor neelika malavige dr rajeva de silva dr danushka dasanayaka and the presenting author today will be dr nilanka vikramasinghe cause of encephalitis there are two major forms one is in india receptor encephalitis where the, where the antigen is the nmda receptor and then there is limbic encephalitis where there are multiple targets this is the first study in sri lanka which aimed to study the prevalence of pathogenic autoantibodies and the clinical characteristics among patients presenting to hospital with a with suspected autoimmune encephalitis We recruited 142 patients who were suspected of autoimmune encephalitis and who got admitted to government hospitals under the care of a neurologist over a period of 12 months. The CSF of these patients were reacted on transfected hex cells that expressed these antigens, and the antibody binding was detected using indirect immunofluorescence microscopy. As you can see in these figures, the healthy control CSF shows no binding. whereas the patient csf shows positive immunofluorescence binding when we look at our 142 patients the mean age was 27 years and they represented 21 out of the 25 districts 65 of our patients fulfilled the diagnostic criteria for nmdr receptor encephalitis only 3 fulfilled the diagnostic criteria for limbic encephalitis next we looked into this group of 65 patients 29 patients were positive for nmdr receptor antibody this was the only antibody detected when we compare the two groups of nmdr antibody positive and the nmdr antibody negative groups the mean age was less in the antibody positive when you look at the clinical features except for speech dysfunction the rest of the clinical features was somewhat similar between the two groups the nmdr antibody positive group had a better outcome with less mortality and they improved much better with immunotherapy so in conclusion nmdr encephalitis is the most commonest form of autoimmune encephalitis in sri lanka as is reflected elsewhere in the world and the clinical characteristics and other demographic features were somewhat similar between the two groups of antibody positive and an antibody negative in mdr encephalitis patients thank you judges right thank you uh, this is a very elegant study with a very very simple message can i just confirm when you screened for all the auto antibodies the nmda r uh, was the only one that you detected yes we screen for these uh, nmdr ampa 1 2 and agi all these uh, the six uh, antigens and the uh, in antibodies and nmdr was the only one detected out of the 140 patients how difficult was it to get this data and the csf from these patients from over 20 different districts so uh, we uh, the main focus was we were in uh, the medical research institute in kalambo and from there uh, using a network of the neurologists we uh, and our professor tashi chang was also uh, is also a neurologist so he contacted the neurologists all over sri lanka and uh, 
we educated them on this research and got them to send these samples and the data, uh, and we did the follow up as well. Excellent. It's basically a teamwork, I would say. Yeah, good. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, this is Arosha. One question. Now, you had a lot of, you know, psychiatric uh, clinical symptoms, etc. Uh, yes. In the presence of all these, uh, especially the psychiatric and cognitive, how do you explain the complete absence of uh, uh, those antibodies which can cause a limbic encephalitis? What's your thought on that? So, uh, we... Um... We, ex we checked the serum uh, and the CSF, of, we, we obtained the CM, serum and the CSF of these patients. The CSF uh, of the patients who were more, more likely to be an MDR in, uh, encephalitis were checked. And the uh, serum of the patients uh, who were more likely to be limbic encephalitis were checked along with the CSF. But still, uh, we didn't get uh, any antibodies positive here, except for an MDR antibodies. Okay, that's fine. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm ready for the next one whenever Arusha is as well. Okay, so thank you. I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. We can bring in the next presenter. Post oh. presentation 19. Okay, Patterns of admissions due to poisoning and outcome at Lady at Lady Ridgeway Hospital. The authors are uh, Ratnayaka A P and Veera Surya A D. The presenting author today is Veera Surya A D. Title is the pattern of admissions due to poisoning and outcome at Lady Ridgeway Hospital. And the introduction is uh, poisoning is a common childhood accident, and uh, poisoning patterns change according to the age group, availability, and accessibility, and uh, familiarity with the product. And uh, yeah. we get. Uh, my method is that uh, retrospective and this descriptive study was done on childhood poisoning at Lady Ridgeway Hospital. Then the, all patient records of admissions following poisoning in the year 2017 were analyzed and uh, data extraction were uh, pre-tested prior to collecting uh, records. Analysis was done by using Excel package. And uh, according to my research, then uh, most, uh, then, uh, if we get the percentage frequency of age distribution, then the highest rate is number of patients, uh, the age limit is one to three years. Then the, if we get the circumstances exposure, uh, that uh, percentage frequency of uh, that uh, unintentional accidents, uh, then that is the most prominent uh, uh, that, uh, circumstance. Mm. Is it? And if we get uh, the distribution of uh, patients by age and type, then the pharmaceutical of human are the most prominent one. And the, the end. second one is the household poisoning. And uh, if you get the male-female ratio, that is uh, nearly one-to-one. -one. And uh, the conclusion is the majority of childhood poisoning by household chemicals and pharmaceuticals. And it is uh, accidental. In accidental poisoning, most were the, in the age group of one to three years. Suicidal attempts of uh, one to three years. In that case, suicidal attempts started after 10 years of age. and. Uh, no deaths were reported in the, during my study period. And uh, this is the conclusion of my study.
<clears throat> we may go ahead with the questions. So. Great. Thank you for your presentation. I am pleased that there were no deaths in your study and the majority of accidental exposures were in children. What do you think is the next step as a result of your study? Well, what are you going to do with the data? Yeah, this is uh, that accidental poisoning that uh, I think uh, the percent, if we get the percentage frequency of age distribution, the most, uh, they are mostly used the uh, availability of their uh, agent types. That means uh, household chemicals and pharmaceuticals. That, uh, that this is uh, main uh, availability and uh, easy accessibility, I think. Yeah. And, uh, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, were you able to see what type of paracetamol preparation was taken? Was it the yeah. was it then liquid in, uh, or was it a tablet? Yeah, it is, yes, liquid. That's one, two, three age group. The liquid paracetamol levels that uh, they can't measure uh, the proper uh, measuring they, they are they don't have the proper measuring uh, i think so uh, and the droppers so the uh, spoons and the uh, other one is uh, sometimes they have uh, that uh, miss uh, by mistake they taken uh, the other solutions then the, say in the same bottles some have uh, paracetamol paracetamol syrup and some have uh, that uh, pinitone syrup and they, by mistake, they take an, uh, in a, another liquids that is due to poisoning. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm ready for the next one whenever Arusha is. I'm ready too. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, poster presentation 20. A clinical audit on recognition and management of strokes in a tertiary care hospital of Sri Lanka. The authors are Edrisingha E M D T, Ekanayaka E J C, Fernando P. The presenting author today is Jayasekara M M P T. Good evening. Uh, my topic is it's a clinical audit on recognition and management of PVAs in Tertiary Care Hospital of Sri Lanka. And as you all know, worldwide strokes are the second most common leading cause of death and the third leading cause of disability. So the recognition of strokes depending on the admitting doctors, knowledge and practices. So we conducted an audit over 13, uh, 14 months period. Initial one of the retro retrospective study for 11 months. That was the first cycle. Then the second cycle was three months with the prospective studies after introducing a stroke tool. The results, initial 11 months, we had 28 people admitted to stroke, mean age of 66 years, 20 males and 8 females. And second cycle after, uh, it's a prospective study, there were about 11 patients, mean age of 77. First cycle, the onset of stroke was recorded in 18 patients, that is about 64% of patients. But the second cycle, all 100% of patients are uh, recognized and recorded the findings. So the mean onset to door time of a patient was 26 hours in the first cycle and the 40 hours in the uh, second cycle. In the first cycle, disability was identified in all 28 people as weakness, but they were specified only in 23 patients. But the second cycle, all were identified and specified uh, as what is the exact weakness. So the CT brain was performed, that is the uh, patient's admission to the CT time. Uh, first cycle, it was 128 minutes. Second cycle, it was 69 minutes. So there were four patients and three patients were given aspirin and antihypertensives before performing the CT scan in the first cycle. The second cycle, no one was given that any kind of drug. 
before performing a CT scan. So in conclusion, there has been significant improvement of recognition of stroke by doctors, but the recognition of stroke and early presentation by patient need to be addressed. Our stroke tool we used uh, was the FAST score and the Rossier score. After introducing that, we conduct the second one. So we have noticed uh, marked improvement of the uh, stroke, but uh, the limitation of my study is actually it's uh, 28 patients in the initial cycle and the second cycle is 11 uh, patients because the newly established unit, we had only 28 patients over that 11 months. The subsequent three months, there were 11 patients and now we have enough patients. Thank you. Okay, we may proceed with the questions. Sir. Thank you. Can I understand what's the difference between the retrospective and the prospective and first and second cycles? Was there an intervention? Is there something you did to try and improve the awareness? Of yes. Stroke? The initial is the retros that? retrospective study. And after studying that, we have introduced a stroke tool, which is based on the uh, fast, uh, this uh, fast, score and the Rossier score and we have uh, educated the doctors regarding the Rossier score. They were given the instructions uh, to admit the patient according to the Rossier score. So after, that is why then after that I conduct the prospective study for three months. So that is why the improvement is there. What was the gap between the first and second cycle? How long did the learning take before and you started the second cycle? It's about four weeks, one month period. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, the fact that the patients, though they were diagnosed as having weakness, they were given aspirin by the admitting doctors. Is it possible that they, though they wrote weakness, they diagnosed actually a stroke? Is that is that possible? It is possible, sir, because uh, they have written it as a stroke. Now we have uh, read the, the actually it's as the retrospective study. We have to read the patient's notes. They have mentioned just weakness. Uh, some are not specified, but they recognize the diagnosis and stroke and they just gave aspirate. That was the initial period before introducing the stool tool. All right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm ready. Can okay. you go ahead, sir? I'm ready now, too. Okay. Um, Post to presentation 21 an audit on adequacy of information provided on routine blood film request to a single tertiary unit in Sri Lanka. The authors are. H.S.A. Williams, M.N. Dilhani. The presenting author today is M.N. Dilhani. Good afternoon. Let me present my poster, uh, which is based on an audit titled An Audit on Adequacy of Information Provided on Routine Blood Film Requests to a Single Tertiary Unit in Sri Lanka. All of us know a blood film is an invaluable laboratory investigation in the workup of both hematological and non-hematological diseases. Even novel automated analysis would not totally replace this role. The aim of this audit was to assess the adequacy of clinical information provided and identify and correct the defective areas of routine blood film request forms. We collected data from 503 consecutive blood film requests received from the professorial medical unit from January to April 2019, a four-month period. Three main audit criteria were ascertained with the expected rate of 100%, namely the presence of patient's demography, the first criterion, name, age, and the sex at least, requesting doctor's contact information, presence of requesting doctor's contact information, and the third criterion was the presence of relevant clinical signs, symptoms, and investigations. A re-audit was followed through after the 
first audit with a redesigned blood claim request form and education of the requesting medical officers. Let's look at the results of the audit. Of the all blood claim requests received, an acceptable level of information found in 52% only. Inadequate or inappropriate information contained in 27% of the requests. Clinical findings and investigations were not stated at all in 9% of the requests. 8% of the samples not processed due to lack of sample quality, either they were plotted or request or sample was alone received. There were 4% of the requests which were ineligible. Nearly 50% of the requests had an associated defect hindering optimal reporting. Audit criteria improved to 100% upon implementation of the corrective measures. Clinically relevant information. In conclusion, I would like to conclude that clinically relevant information required for the interpretation and production of a good quality sensible report was lacking in nearly half of the blood film requests. Use of a specially designed blood film request form in place of the common pathology request form. Improved reporting as it effectively provided the targeted clinical information required for the interpretation of the morphological findings. Thank you. Give us one second, sir. Okay, we can proceed. Great. Thank you for your presentation. You have demonstrated that a lot of these blood film requests are incompletely completed. So there, there's a lot of information. Can you confirm that with your new blood test form, you did a re-audit and 100% improvement? I, I didn't quite get that data. So, so how, how many did you then retest after your new form? Sir, uh, we designed a special uh, blood film request containing targeted clinical information so that the house officers can pick on rather than writing uh, in detail uh, in a time efficient manner. Uh, we actually uh, analyzed similar number of requests here. For the uh, audit, we analyzed 503 consecutive blood film requests received during a four month period. To compare that, we analyzed similar number of requests new, uh, with the newly designed request form on a uh, similar number of requests. Um, right. Uh, one question. <clears throat> now, these new forms, the problem is very often they take a lot of time to complete. Did you assess the time taken for to complete the existing government form properly and the new form? The thing is, uh, yes, uh, depending on, on the indication for the uh, blood smears request, the amount of uh, data that you should provide for the specific indication may differ. If it is a layer, uh, I think uh, indication is for a pyrexia of unknown origin or a lymphoma, uh, we may need to provide uh, a lengthy uh, request form. So uh, I, actually we didn't uh, look at uh, comparatively between the two requests, the time duration they are consuming. Uh, so do you have different uh, forms for different conditions? Like P one form for PU and one form for other things? Do you have different forms? No, sir. It's the same form, but depending on the requests, uh, we have uh, uh, given a list of symptoms and signs. The relevant symptoms and signs, they have to pick off. And if there are any additional okay, data, right. given a That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay so thank you very much. Thank you. I'm okay. I'm ready to. Okay. Our final poster presentation for the day and for the session. Uh, poster presentation 22, an audit on the quality of written referrals from the outpatient departments 
to the specialist, specialist clinics at Provincial General Hospital, Badrula. The authors are Mihirani AMS, Vidyaratna SC, and the presenting author today is Leena Patirana C. Thank you. So our audit was on the quality of uh, written referrals from the outpatient department to specialist clinics at Provincial General Hospital, Badulna. Um, this was mainly done because of the curiosity we saw in these adult referral forms. And we feel that if we write a proper referral, it benefits the patient as well as the health system. So what we, the standard that we used was uh, this uh, nine checklist, which was published in the Journal of Family Medicine and Primary Care in April 2030. That was a local issue. So we compared these nine checklists as well as uh, for the appropriateness of history and adequacy, legibility of handwriting and timeliness. So we, uh, we got a total of 117 referrals. And uh, from those, the name, date, and the referred unit was always, almost always mentioned. But uh, when comparing the other uh, uh, parameters, the symptoms and signs, they were mentioned, but uh, the adequacy of the history taking was not adequate. So 67% the appropriate or adequate history taking was not included. Um, when comparing the others, the investigation, the probable diagnosis, comorbidities, and the treatment, whatever they gave or the patient has received before, or allergic history, family social history, they were mostly lacking in these in those referrals. And uh, when it comes to the appropriateness of basic investigations they could do, uh, there was marked absence of, again, not uh, done investigations in 78 of those referrals. And again, a remarkable absence of the urgency, uh, not treating whether the patient should be reached, uh, checked um, uh, immediately or whether the patient can wait for some time like that. So there was a remarkable absence of writing that as well. And the selection of specialty, of course, they did well, only 9% um, uh, defaulted in that. So uh, in uh, concluding the, this audit, we found that there were main key areas, especially the, of the nine parameters, as well as especially mentioning the urgency and the adequate uh, writing of notes was not uh, uh, properly done. Therefore, actually, we, can, we uh, did one lecture on uh, telling them the outcomes of our audit and also briefed about the major lacking parts. And we are hoping to do some more um, uh, lectures in the future and uh, reassess it after about three months to see whether we, we have had um, our lecture series have had any impact on our audit findings. Thank you. Okay, very good. okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. You have demonstrated that nearly all the referral letters were inadequate. And the only yes. thing that most of them got right was the patient's name and the referral unit. Yes. Can you tell me how we're going to improve it? You say lecture series. Do you think that's going to be enough or do you need to? Yeah, you, um, why I say is because uh, these uh, MOs who are doing the OPDs, most of them are very chronic MOs who have been serving that area for a long time. So they hardly have uh, like uh, uh, got new information, you know, about what to do. And even I think they might have lost their tracking of the medicine, basic history taking even. So first at least to like brush up their knowledge and to see if a patient comes with chest pain, what basic needs, old patient ECG, a mask, something like that, you know. So, so like that will help first to be start off with. Then, of course, we have to see uh, once we build up their knowledge apart, um, then we can proceed with see what we can do uh, to uh, do uh, the areas that they are not improving, what else we could arrange. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, there, you mentioned that urgency was not mentioned in the referrals. Yes, I'm just yes. wondering, even if they wrote, is there any system in your hospital where, you know, you ask some patients yeah, to yeah. come only three, three months later and some patients exactly. to come immediately? Because I've yes. never seen that happen in Sri Lanka in any hospital about, uh, you know, urgency uh, in referral clinics. Uh, yes. Do you think that writing that would have helped or do yeah. you think you yes, have a system? 
yeah uh, actually that was i inquired from uh, in my clinic the triage is usually done by our nurse but usually i have told now if hypertension they refers if stage 3 i have to see it me today and or like i have to sort it out then and there like that i have educated my nurse but then i got I told her that I need to tell the other, I, I want to see what the other triage, other clinics who tri, um, who's done, whether it's a doctor or the nurse. And depending on that, I had the plan also to like inform them as well through their consultants, respective consultants. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we come to the conclusion of the final poster for the annual session 2020 of CCP. I would like to take the opportunity to thank our judges, Professor Anup Chauhan and Dr. Arusha Disana. Uh, so now you may uh, discuss regarding the judging of the posters. Right.